Good afternoon, everyone. So we're going to start the second uh, plenary session of this afternoon on uh, basic income experiments. So this is going to be a more theoretical and general um, session than perhaps uh, the one we just had before and others that we had uh, during this Congress. Uh, my name is Roberto Merrill. I teach philosophy at the University of Minho. And I do research, uh, a lot of uh, my research is on UBI uh, at the Center for Ethics, Politics and Society of uh, the University of Minho. So it is for me a great honor to be here with uh, such uh, respectable uh, researchers. Uh, so let me introduce them and uh, then I will ask a few questions. They will each reply uh, to those questions. And then we're going to have uh, quite a lot of time for uh, questions from the audience. So um, Sumi Lee is uh, very happy to be here, she told me, because actually this, is, uh, this university is her alma mater. So uh, um, she's also, of course, uh, a professor at the uh, University of La Verne in California at the Department of Public Administration. And her research interests include state and local public finance, fiscal institutions, redistributive policies, and economic resilience. Uh, she's been uh, doing some research on um, recently on attitudes and sentiments uh, towards uh, basic income, uh, probably um, worldwide, but also in the US. And um, so, Perhaps she can tell us more about it during this discussion. Um, I don't know if uh, any of you know the man sitting next to me, but he's uh, an activist of uh, uh, UBI. He's been doing this for some time. And um, he is quite unique. Uh, I, have, I have to say, I, I quite admire what he does. Uh, for example, Philippe Van Parij is my philosophical hero, one of my philosophical heroes. But sometimes he writes books that have nothing to do with basic income, and that's okay. But um, uh, Guy uh, writes books that, for example, are always related to basic income, but uh, many people, for example, in Portugal, in the left, uh, extreme left, like Guy a lot when we talk about the precariat and, 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 and the commons, and then I say, yeah, but he defends basic income, and I kind of ignore it. Yeah, okay, but that doesn't matter what is important. So he's able to reach a very large audience. I think that's quite unique in our uh, family of basic income uh, defenders. And uh, sitting next to, uh, to uh, Sumi uh, is uh, one of the warmest uh, people I've met in my life, very sweet man, and uh, of course, we're all very lucky to have him as a chair of Bien. He's been doing a, a lot of work on UB experiments in India. I think right now he's engaged in one experiment in Hyderabad, where he lives. And of course, he has written a book uh, with Guy on an experiment they, uh, they designed and uh, followed in India. And uh, Guminyi is a research um, fellow at the Institute for Political and Economic Alternatives. Uh, he has written on energy poverty, housing policy, estimation of income distribution, basic income experiments, and the labor market and income redistribution effects of basic income. He's also a participant of the steering committee of Basic Income Korean Network. So our session is going to last one and a half hours. We're not going to have a um, coffee break as we previously had planned because it doesn't make much sense. And I'm going to start by saying some very basic stuff, but just to you know remind us all what we're talking about. So I would say, uh, before asking my first question, that uh, UB experiments can be justified mainly in four ways. The first way is the scientific claim, that is the empirical evidence they can collect. The second cl claim is the delib deliberative claim, that is the role the evidence collected can have in shaping the normative, the ethical debate 
And me, as a political philosopher, that's my favorite uh, justification for basic income because it really helps me to uh, debate uh, against other political philosophers who, who are against basic income. And third, uh, the third possible justification is, of course, an evidence-based claim, that is how evidence can lead to policy implementations. And finally, by, it can be also justified by an advocacy claim, how, how, how these experiments can attract media attention and spark debates and movements pro UBI. So I know that all of us here and, and, and also in the public share these uh, justifications, but I was curious to ask each of you to tell me which of these four justifications you find my most convincing for your own work and according to your own priorities. Okay, so perhaps Guy, you can start by replying and then. I will be very brief. I think uh, all four are important and dependent on the design of the experiment or demonstration project. I, I would like to begin by saying that uh, I have the dubious distinction of being crazy enough to have been involved in pilots and experiments in four continents of the world and have been doing it for many years. So obviously uh, I have experience and I think each of those four sometimes is more relevant at different phases of both the experiment and afterwards, and it varies. So I, I think they are equally important. My response won't be brief. Um, and then my response is mostly based on uh, my observation about the pilot programs in the US and I am not uh, extremely familiar with any other uh, pilots so that's uh, my limitation for this response. I think the findings from experiments could be really uh, useful depending on uh, what specific things uh, they want to know. And we just heard about stories and uh, narratives from Korean experiment with a very small popular small sample 17 and 10 people and uh, how um, unconditional tra cash transfer could be empowering. Uh, but I have a lot of reservation about pilots um, because many people already pointed out that um, pilot programs assume that there is a bigger bigger uh, scheme, bigger plan uh, for implementation. But in my observation in the US, the pilots don't have any plan for an expansion. Um, they are funded by uh, private charity and nonprofit and uh, governments. And the government funding that I have seen, I, I looked at uh, more than 60 pilot programs and try to put together the funding sources and uh, what I found is that even the government sources are all from um, the federal emergency funding in response to the COVID. So there is no plan for a constant revenue stream in the future to sustain this uh, pilot program to expand, expand to a larger scale uh, um, a basic income program. And also, um, the pilot sites are usually in very big cities and uh, they tend to be pretty liberal and also uh, that implies that some of the really politically vulnerable places are uh, likely to be excluded from um, sort of like um, uh, ubi movement and uh, opportunities to actually uh, be exposed to the universal basic income and uh, sorry, just stop me if you will think that I, I go too long. And the targets, the um, population that pilot programs are targeting, what I gathered is usually, yeah, means tested, low income households, single moms, sometimes it's race specific, uh, and formerly incarcerated population, uh, families with children only, artists, foster youth, and so on and so forth. So these are um, categorical and means tested. So we know only a very specific uh, evidence 
about this population, but it is really difficult to know, like a lot of people already pointed out, the long-term effects and the community impacts and so on and so forth. And uh, there's also, uh, uh, I think uh, what's really uh, important is, uh, another thing I wanna uh, mention is that there is no plan to scale up. So I'm gonna uh, uh, touch on this uh, a little later, but I think it's the most important pro uh, problem because we expect pilots to be elevated to the national uh, uh, UBI plan adoption, but I don't think that series of pilots will automatically emerge uh, to uh, uh, be able to uh, become a national uh, legislation. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> I think, uh, obviously, I think an experiment is done to produce evidence. I mean, that is uh, a given. But um, I think we should not forget the fact that this evidence-based policymaking is of recent origin. And um, a lot of uh, policymaking happens along pragmatic considerations or political commitment or uh, things like that. So the evidence does not automatically lead to policy making. Uh, we have seen in our uh, both Madhya Pradesh experience and also the current experience we are doing in Hyderabad study. Uh, there is a lot of resistance from the politicians also to a new idea like this. Like what I find, I think all these justifications is fine, but I would still take evidence with a pinch of salt because imagine abolition of slavery, there was no pilot done anywhere. Adult franchise, when it was given to women, there was no pilot done. So I, I don't think we should rule out the political commitment part. Now what, what evidence does is to add to the conversation in a particular context. That's why a pilot is needed because it opens conversation about what is a basic income number one equally and more importantly it puts the existing system on a stress test so that conversation that is much more important than the evidence per se because automatically how much evidence do we need before a politician takes a decision how many pilots do we need I mean, how, rural pilot, urban pilot, pilots here, pilot there. So there are 100 pilots in the US. I mean, there are hundreds of pilots everywhere. So to me, what is important as an advocate is what it does to the conversation, what it does to the existing system, how it can uh, put a critical lens on what is not working now, as much as to showcase that basic income works better along these lines blah 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 okay so uh, I, I would uh, i mean advocacy producing evidence i think is a continuous process there is a learning curve it automatically i don't expect because i'll i'll feel i would burn out if i expect politicians to grab my evidence and say yay fantastic we are going to implement it no they won't and the politicians when i meet them they say oh but we are already doing that. We are already reaching the last mile. We are already doing this. So what is so new about this? You know, things like that. There's a lot of resistance. That the other danger is when one political party takes a position in favor of, this is what happened in India, and Congress took a position in favor of uh, basic income, their own rendering of basic income, the opposition party, which is our ruling party now, automatically takes the opposite position. They don't even want to listen to this because it's a Congress party policy. So I would only say that you, this evidence, you still have to navigate the system with your evidence, but it's important to have a rigorous scientific study so that it brings credibility to what you are saying. Otherwise, nobody will take seriously. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. 
from my perspective, the most important justification is the advocacy claim. But I would like to use the term bounded advocacy to make my case here. Well, if you think about pilots, and let's assume that there is a level of a meaningful level of basic income, and that will mean that we need to reform the taxation system to a certain degree, and the existing social welfare system has to be revised or modified. So the analysis of effects of these experiments can be limited. Unlike other justifications, the advocacy claim is based on understanding the unique characteristics of experiments. And it looks at the potential implications of these experiments and looks at how this can contribute to a pro-UBI movement. So it is meaningful and it is important, but I believe that the outcomes of analysis are limited because it's very difficult to control all the causal mechanism and the design of the pilot, the objectives, well, all the unique context of a particular society or a country is reflected. So we cannot really create or replicate a closed system in these pilots. So this data can be meaningful, but it is limited. And when it comes to the evidence, they cannot really replace the norms for the basic income. So in this respect, I would say that I would like to use the term bounded advocacy. Thanks so much. Really interesting, uh, because I thought it was a trivial question, but actually uh, the replies are very different. And uh, Sumi is saying, I think, all right, we'll talk about it later on, but you seem to completely disregard experiments, almost. So let's go to the second question. Assuming that uh, experiments have some utility, what should be the main goal of a uh, experiments for example should it be to reduce poverty and social exclusion reduce sanctions of actual social policies evaluate its impact on the labor market promote personal autonomy promote social and political participation evaluate the ecological impact for example i mean i just want you to tell me what is for you the main goals i, I know all of these are important but what in your context or or whatever you prefer to say, it seems more important. Thanks. First of all, I think uh, the first round of comments have illustrated one of the problems that we've had on this, dis on this subject over the last 20 years or so. I, I know a very few pilots I claim that our pilot in Madhya Pradesh was the biggest, uh, most sustained pilot of a basic income. Because a basic income is paid to every individual in the community. It is quasi universal in that you have to exclude certain type of migrants and you have to focus on usual residents. So it's quasi universal, but it has to be taking into account network effects because everybody is getting it and there are certain effects that affect other groups and there are feedback effects that come in. And the I think it's important to make the distinction between demonstration projects with a few people, uh, which is a particular group prisoners, care leavers like we're doing in Wales and so on, and a proper pilot, okay? And all the experiments in the United States are experiments. And uh, the, the nearest 
uh, to a pilot is what I've called in my book the accidental pilot in North Carolina, which was uh, giving out from the casino money to all the Indian community. And it coincided with the beginning of a uh, longitudinal study of child development, which has been going on for 20 years. And we've been able to see what happens to those who've received a basic income in the community compared with other communities. And it's re very revealing uh, the findings. I think all of these experiments uh, and pilots, very critical point that is given too little attention is very important is it shows how a basic income should be introduced and what else besides the basic income should be introduced to increase the effectiveness the impact and the positive effects and one of the things we did in madhya pradesh was we divided the communities into where everybody received a basic income but there was no voice organization operating and other areas where everybody received a basic income and the voice op agency was also involved to give advice and help and etc cetera, etc cetera. and i don't think any other uh, pilot or experiment has actually introduced that element and i think it's very important so i want to i want there are obviously other things we could mention, but I think those two issues, how it should be done, I've just been invited, I'm delighted to accept, invited to Ukraine to advise the government on how to introduce an emergency basic income uh, in the aftermath of the war, if it ever ends. Um, it's a dangerous mission, but it, how to introduce a basic income in that context is an extremely interesting issue. So the question is, what should be the main goal of a UBI experiment? Um, I think given the limited evidence that we can get from pilot experiments and so on, I think the main goal is to uh, finding the agency of the vulnerable people. So that stories we heard before this session is really powerful. And then one of the challenges, psychological challenges that uh, UBI folks have is what people say is like poor people are lazy, they don't know what's good for them and so on and so forth. But when poor people get their uh, get a, a unconditional transfer the little bit of money right it's not a lot of money usually but for that little bit of money can empower them enormously right so uh, we have that evidence and storytelling and that, that is really powerful that pilot programs can tell us and i want to uh, talk about evidence a little bit what we can learn from these pilots is uh, I think very limited and little. And uh, I think we have to think about other sources of evidences. Uh, one is like observational studies and natural experiments. And another one is uh, micro simulations and so forth, right? So for if we really need evidence to supplement the normative argument about UBI is to tri triangulate, you know, those those uh, uh, observations and pilot evidence from the pilots and the natural experiment. And I want to uh, add one more thing is that we need to do the pilots to uh, kind of take away the conditions uh, from the existing social welfare system. So when um, someone asked me, about what to do in New York City pilot. I suggested them to experiment um, where we can take away the conditions of a welfare transfers within the existing system and see what happens, right? If there's any difference at all, 
then having conditions just to make um, people to work hard and actually penalize them, right? So I think it's uh, really, it's gonna be really revealing to do that kind of pilot. And if that's successful, we can expand it in the existing system a little more easily. And even if it's not the full UBI, we can always push our agenda into the direction of the full UBI. Okay, um, I think uh, when we are doing a pilot, what should be the goal of a pilot? Somewhere I feel that there are two obsessions we have. One obsession is with those who oppose the idea. So we, we are obsessed with how to convince them is one obsession. The, op the other obsession we have is the problem solving mode that we want to we want UBI to fix a particular problem, whether it is poverty or whatever. Now, I think if we can get out of this, uh, if we say a pilot is necessary to give an experience to a community, to go through this whole experience of all the five uh, characteristics of a basic income. So it's not, it's not going to fix a problem. I think we are talking about it creates a material condition what a pilot does is it helps us to understand what are the supplementary policies that are required along with a UBI. Because we, it has become a rhetoric to say UBI is not a panacea. But the point is when you give a UBI to a community, what are these supplementary policies that are required? I'll give a small example. When we, uh, the Madhya Pradesh project, when we were leaving, I think during this 18 months period, the farmers actually stopped going to the money lenders. Okay, so that actually, the, that's the multiplier effect uh, that we saw with the farmers. So when the project was over, they said, oh my God, we will have to go back to the money lenders. So they requested the union, that is where the voice organization, they requested the union that you do whatever, avoid, we should avoid going back to the money lenders, which means the union was forced to create a revolving fund from where they could take a soft loan. Okay, so we realized that when there is a UBI, you should also have supplementary other institutions to be established. So experiment gives us a clue of what could those either supply side, uh, institutions or um, supplementary institutions, microcredit institutions or cooperatives, whatever. I think those are the, that's, that's what experience. We have a learning curve. So I, I don't think we should think in a very mechanistic way that, you know, here's the problem, here is the solution. I don't, I think we should look at the learning curve. Yeah, that should be the, I would say that should be the uh, objective of a UBI experiment. At the same time, as I said earlier, I think it really puts the, uh, the existing system to a stress test. It critiques the, this experience actually critiques the existing system. So when people experience this, they know what is wrong with the other uh, existing programs. So those are the net learning curve, those are the net effects I see from an experiment. I think that reducing poverty and inequality should be the primary goal of basic income experiments. And I believe these underlie many of the positive effects that basic income will produce. Of course, it is important to recognize that analyzing the inequality reducing effects of a basic income through experiments has fundamental limitations as experimental ethical considerations that no one should be economically harmed by experiment preclude the inclusion of high income individuals in the experimental group who would be potential net contributors if basic income were actually introduced. Of course, the areas of poverty and inequality reduction that we should be paying attention to 
should not be limited to economic variables such as income. We should also be paying attention to the reduction of multidimensional poverty, health, housing, education, social and political participation, and social relations. In this regard, it is important to use an appropriate mix of quantitative and qualitative research if possible, to not only estimate the size of the effects of regular, stable, and predictable income payments on health, housing, education, social, and political participation, and social relationships, but also to identify the mechanisms that produce such positive changes. Thank you. Uh, to the four of you. Again, very different opinions. <clears throat> so my next question would be, of, of all the experiments you've uh, studied, observed, um, <clears throat> um, did you, were you surprised by some of the results? I mean, really surprised, like I wasn't expecting this at all in a, in, in a good way or in a bad way. For example, I remember when I read the first report of the Barcelona experiment, at some point, um, I read that the people who received conditional income felt happier than the ones who uh, received the unconditional income. And I was quite surprised by that. And then the report had a good explanation for it, but then it was a surprise. Well, we found with our pilots um, some remarkable findings. I remember in the Namibia uh, pilot, which was probably the first in a developing country, one of the things that we accidentally evaluated was the impact on crime. And we saw an incredible reduction in economic crime during the course of, of the pilot. Very important thing. Second thing we found, and I remember I've told members of Bien of this story before, but I, I think it's sufficiently important internationally to be worth repeating. I remember at the end of the pilot in Namibia, I was visiting one of the villages and I asked three young women to come and talk to me. And I said, what is the most important thing for you of having had a basic income? And they giggled and were timid, as you would expect. And then one of them had the courage and she said, before we had the basic income, when the men came down at the end of the month and had their money wages in their pockets, we had to say yes. Now we've had our basic income, we say no. That's a huge impact. Less emotionally, we were impressed, Sarath will ex elaborate no doubt, that during the Madhya Pradesh pilot, we saw a very important effect, which was that people with a basic income, even if they had low incomes from whatever they were doing, started to pay down their debt, reduce their debt. And at the same time, they were making savings for their security. Now, that's an important thing. The last point I want to make, and there are other, obviously others, is that only with a proper pilot do you see multiplier effects. And the multiplier effects are that the spending that is induced leads to the rise in income, leads to rise in petty investment, leads to the increase in the incomes way above the initial payment of the basic income. So in a sense, potentially, if it's well designed, a pilot can show you what would induce an economic effect that would almost pay for itself. And the feedback effects are on health for the same thing. So those, those macro type effects have been given insufficient attention because we haven't had appropriate designs. But some of the findings uh, uh, that I could go on about are also exp uh, findings that are important and surprising in the, in the 
substantial effects they, ex that are, are shown. And I think that those are important because they inform the debate and feed into the political discussion. Um, what I remember that really surprised me was uh, one experiment, not explicitly UBI, but um, unconditional cash transfer to poor uh, families in Africa. What I learned is that um, when cash is given to families, the girls, you know, the daughter's nutrition was improved much more than the son's nutrition. What that reveals is that when they have very little money, they feed boys first. But when they have extra income, extra money, the effect was bigger for girls than the boys. So that was um, shocking. I think next time, uh, if the organizers put me and Guy on the same panel, I will withdraw because <laughs> he's already said what I wanted to say. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, <laughs> With, um, I was not convinced about basic income at all when I started working on the Madhya Pradesh pilot project. So everything was a surprise to me. So, um, at, in fact, my conversion took place while the study was going on. One of the things that really revealing and surprising was what periodicity, periodic inf uh, income, does to you psychologically, the sense of security, what it does to your time horizon. So how, I mean, we think the poor cannot plan, but I think that's exactly at a micro level, I was able to see how meticulously they can plan. Like for example, the farmers, they, they had to depend on money lenders, but then since they had cash, the guy talked about multiplier effect. Now, how, I'll tell you how X becomes 28X. X is what we gave, six people in the house, that's already 6X. And before the sowing season coming, three months, they saved the money, all the money. So that's 18X. Now, when you have 18X in your hand, it's so easy to go and ask your neighbor a soft loan of 10X. So that's, that's how... 28x it becomes that's that kind of multiplied effect so your credit worthiness goes up in the community since everybody is getting the money everybody knows that you will you will get you will be repaid okay that was one very interesting uh, thing the other is about the um, we have a very congenital mistrust of the youth young people means we we worry that they will drink alcohol or they will do drugs whatever now, I really like uh, Scott Santon's uh, Quentin Tarantino <laughs> argument, <laughs> which is like, yes, people will watch videos. So let them watch videos. What's the problem? So, uh, and why should we defend it? Uh, why should we say that, no, 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 they will not drink? Now, there were a handful of youth, six young people in that village, in one particular village. Two months, we saw three months, we saw they were simply hanging around. They were doing nothing. They were not going to work also. Suddenly, one fine morning, they said, we have a pond in our village, but why don't we fish? Why don't we learn? Let's go to the neighboring village. Six of them went, they learned, they bought this fish seed, they learned how to do it, they came back, and then they started a fishing cooperative. I mean, just out of the blue. So we think that those fellows are idling away, doing nothing, what are they doing? So that gave nutrition to the village, income to these boys, and then we thought that they will spend it away. They saved the money, okay? And they had many, many other multiplier uh, effect. That was quite surprising um, to me. Yeah, um, well, I can, let's stop here. Yes, <laughs> 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 
Although it was a guaranteed income experiment rather than a basic income experiment, the findings presented in the first here outcomes analysis of the Stockton Seed experiment are interesting. First, it is noteworthy that seed participants' ideas and beliefs about challenging existing stereotypes and assumptions about the poor and working poor are noteworthy. And it is also impressive that the results of the experiment provided evidence to support the participants' ideas and beliefs that it is wrong to attribute the primary responsibility for poverty to poor individuals, and that a guaranteed or basic income can contribute to financial security for all. The findings that the guaranteed income reduced households' income instability are very encouraging and can be interpreted as underpinning the findings that the increase in income created other outcomes, namely reduced depression and also this have this gender effect that contributed to women. And third, it is impressive that unlike the Finnish experiment, which focused on the aggregate outcomes of total days of employment and income from jobs, the SEED experiment focused on the proportion of people employed in full-time jobs and was able to clearly show the potential of a guaranteed or basic income to improve the prospects for good jobs. Thanks. Yeah, Guy, I think you said something important at the beginning. I mean, the, the good design will really be very important to, you know, have uh, interesting or surprising effects. Um, since uh, I have the liberty to ask new questions, since we have more time, um, I wanted to, to, to have your opinion on the fact that um, many of the experiments have shown results regarding uh, work that are sometimes disappointing. I mean, this argument is used by many people who are against basic income. Of course, it's not about working more basic income, we know that, but it's also about that. And to convince people to do experiments or even implement it, we, there has to be a way of uh, show that the results um, make people work happier or be more productive. Uh, so could you, I mean, I would say that this is a sort of a disappointment as a result of many of the experiments, and I wanted to have, to have your quick opinion on that. Thanks. Um, well, thank you, Roberto. I, I just, I've just got a new book coming out called The Politics of Time. And in the course of the research I've done for that, I tried to look at all the experiments and pilots and projects on some form of moving towards a basic income. And I want to emphasize this uh, point. The overwhelming finding is that a basic income or something approximating to it results in an increase in work, not a decrease in work. It results quite often in a change in the type of work that people do. More care, more commoning, more uh, taking risks, etc. Again, we found this in our Madhya Pradesh, and it particularly affected women again. And often, the problem is that the data collected in the course of the experiments are inappropriate for looking at the effects. Our standard labor force statistics ask people about their main activity. And the biggest single effect is that it induces people to do second and third type activities. And if you don't ask about those, you will not pick up the real effects. But in effect, people operate by moving towards a more 
uh, embraceive portfolio of activities. And isn't that what life should be about? And I think that this, this effect is something that we should be rejoicing in and uh, emphasizing more because it's the biggest prejudice out there by critics. And we happen to have a hell of a lot of evidence to show that that is a prejudice. So let's, let's shout it. I think that's my answer. Um, increasing work hour doesn't necessarily mean that people become productive. And uh, I think the goal of a basic income is um, giving people to do things for themselves. And so we know that there's evidence that students, like some of my students actually in my university, they work um, you know, full time and then attend the school. If they have little money, then they could reduce their work hours and uh, uh, focus on the study because there are a lot of um, supporting um, programs and institutions within the university, like, you know, academic success center, there's a new fitness center, there's a wellness center that there's a, a yoga, free yoga classes, but student, my students who work full time would never take advantage of all these supporting system within university, only the ones who have a financial support can take advantage of those uh, uh, resources. So I think that um, basic income should increase the work is uh, not necessarily what we want, first of all. And the second, different pilots are being implemented at, at different times and in different uh, regions and different countries. And the work is not something that you can, you can make a decision of 100%, right? It, it depends on the macroeconomic condition where there is a good labor market or bad labor market. So I think expecting some homogeneous outcome is uh, uh, something illusional, I, even, I would even say. And um, in terms specifically for the pilots, I would ask why would we expect people to change their behavior in terms of employment or unemployment? We would celebrate if the result is good to fit our narrative, but I would say participants know this pilot would end within seven months or a year or two. If you have a job, why would you quit? You have to get a job again in, in seven months or, or, or a year or so. If you don't have a job, where, why would you get a job? Because we know there is a poverty trap. If you increase your income, you might lose your social benefit. So I think it's um, too much an expectation that we will find some answer about employment impact from very short pilot programs. I think Roberto, I lost the question. Was it about people work more or? Is it about work? Employment. Yeah. I, Not employment. Work. Work. Oh, work. work. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like uh, what Guy has mentioned, that um, they, there is a predisposition in people wanting to do either desirability, wanting to do a different kind of a job, or wanting to do more of a job. So when you have a sense of security that the periodic regular basic income gives, one of the very interesting findings that we found in, in an MP was uh, in the tribal village, most all, they, almost the entire village, everybody has a patch of land, but not necessarily cultivated, okay? So in the beginning, when we asked them, what is your main activity? primary uh, occupation, okay, 60% of my work, the time use, 60% of my time, I am a wage laborer, and 40% of my time or 30% of my time, I'm a cultivator, okay? I mean, I, that was an average. Now, at the end of the study, in the end line survey, it just reversed that 60% of the time I'm spending on my farm, and 
thirty percent of the time I'm spending as a wage laborer. So there's a predisposition to cultivate your own land. So the non-performing asset, the uncultivable land, got cultivated. The production increased in the village. Productivity has increased in the village. It was just a shift of people. So I mean, like um, from an abusive relationship, you may want to shift, or from an abusive employer you may want to shift so it's a it is at at a micro level it's a very incremental change but substantial change as professor standing said well, we talked about how it can actually increase the number of work, increase the working hours. In interpreting the outcomes of these experiments, we have to be cautious. From in the previous session, this was brought up, actually. Among the positive effects that can come from a basic income experiment, it enables people to they, it allows people to have more time to find the job they want and they can use this time to be trained so that they can find the right job. But the experiment is limited to two years or three years, for example. So when people want to spend this time on trying to find the things that they want to do, well, the outcome would interpret it as reducing working hours. So using this short period of time of two years or three years, well, it is not seen as a positive effect of a BI, but it would see it as a negative impact. So that is where we should be cautious when interpreting the outcomes. And another thing is, it's not just about the outcomes of the BI experiments, but when we look at the outcomes of micro simulation and how a BI payment doesn't reduce provision of labor. Well, there was actually a research outcome that shows that. Okay, many thanks. Well, uh, I liked your example, uh, Sarat, about uh, farmers who spent more time farming, which relates to actually one of the my next question, because I think that's something that we, we should study a lot more is the ecological eff effects of a UBI. And my question for each of you is, uh, which results do you think haven't been studied enough and you would like to uh, to see studied more in, in depth? I, I think this this follows on from your previous question. I think one of the most important challenges for all of those of us in the basic income community and all of us in progressive politics today in the world is to reconceptualize what we mean by work. One of the most stupid things that took place in the 20th century, I'm a labor economist, not, many, not everybody here is, so I apologize to other labor economists if I tell this, but they may not be, others may not be aware. The situation is that if I stop doing a job and look after my children, that means a diminishing amount of GDP. National income goes down. Employment goes down. If I look after your children, do the same amount of time doing that. National income goes up, employment goes up. So we don't count care work, women's work, and it is ridiculous. And satellite accounts in the United States show that if you gave an imputed value to unpaid care work, 
you would increase national income by over a quarter. In my own country, it's over a third. But we don't give any value to that. And we are foolish to allow that to go unchallenged. Because a basic income, as we found, increases time spent on activities that are not measured in GDP. And in a sense, we had a natural experiment during COVID because people were paid on condition that they did no labor. Ridiculous scheme, job furlough it was called, but one of the effects was it induced a huge increase in community work, voluntary work, care work, farming, gardening, all of which in the Martians, if they came down, would regard as work. Now, it's about time we mocked the current conventional statistics and opposed them more vigorously and, and send them up because they're not worthy of the 21st century. So I think that this is a way of trying to answer your, your thing, because I think that part of the experiments and that part of our discourse is something that we, we should all emphasize much more. The researchers who um, conduct the pilot programs do look at a lot of uh, different kinds of impacts like educational health and stuff like that, but um, it's usually given to the household level and assuming that they're going to keep doing uh, that sort of pilot, I think, you know, inspired by this uh, uh, in nutrition improvement for girls, I think I would be curious to know uh, the intra-household allocation of resources. So even if you give uh, um, lump sum money to a household, the impact is not going to be the same for all household members. And so that, that'd be uh, interesting to, to uh, figure out. I, I, I think um, I would like to see more studies on the psychological impact uh not just on mental health but also physical health what this regularity sense of security does to people um not necessarily the poorest of the poor but um i think that that's that's a very important area um not given uh, much in, in uh, importance in studies Although it is a topic that has been actively researched in recent years, I think the research on the health effects of a basic income is still an under-researched but important topic, especially its impact on mental health if the positive if there is positive effect then it would be positive in itself but it will also have a positive impact on a society as a whole by increasing lifetime earnings and productivity through positive effects on education training etc on the other hand, the positive impact of a basic income on health is expected to lower health care and social insurance costs for society as a whole. I think that advances in research on the health effects of a basic income will also contribute to improving our understanding of the economic costs and benefits of a basic income. Thanks a lot. A couple more questions, and then I will open the floor. Uh, could you could you give us um, your opinion on um, the way the media treated uh, some of the most significant experiments? It can be any example you think particularly relevant to, <clears throat> so that we can learn actually how to deal with it, because most of the experiments, the media really destroy the, the, the experiment. So I'd be happy to know 
what do you think about that? With apologies for uh, being self-indulgent, let me just say that one thing I think that future uh, experiments, pilots, whatever we want to call them, should be looking at much more than we've done so far is the ecological uh, effects, uh, the environmental activities induced and the feedback effects and the, the type of activities that, that have that. So I think that that's an area which is going to be politically very important to strengthen. Um, on your question, Roberto, something that really makes me very angry is the bad publicity that was given to the Finland experiment. Finland experiment was not a basic income pilot. I don't think it should be called a pilot. It wasn't even a basic income. It was uh, making benefits for the unemployed unconditional. Very interesting because it was testing whether you need conditionality to have your desired effects, etc. Uh, it was 2,000 unemployed people who received it. Um, but I was, I was involved at the beginning in the designing of it. I urged them to do a proper community one, but that didn't take place. But then halfway through the pilot, I think uh, Jürgen mentioned this, but many people will not know this, and many people are still under the misconception. Halfway through the pilot, the BBC and The Guardian and a number of other media outlets in Europe said, it's been abandoned, it's a failure. And journalists were for calling me up and saying, what do you have to say there? <laughs> Your scheme is a failure. And I checked with the prime minister's office and it hadn't been abandoned. It began on the day that it was planned to begin and it ended on exactly the day it was planned to end from the beginning, right? Now, what annoys me most is I'm still confronted by bloody journalists who haven't done their homework and say, what have you got to say because the Finland pilot was abandoned, etc., etc. Now, this sort of sloppy media is something that is disgraceful. It's disgraceful. And I'm getting the same thing in Wales where we're doing a pilot. But there we are, we've preempted it because I've warned all our advisory committee that this is coming, okay? And not only the Finland thing, but this sort of dirty stuff. So we can preempt it. But I think it's a very important part of our political uh, engagement that we have to preempt and defeat the lies that are fed it through the media. So thanks for giving me a comment. But anybody who thought that Finland was a failure by its own terms, or its own terms, is not telling the truth. So remember that. I agree. Taking away the condition would make no difference. That is a success, isn't it? Uh, but I think um, maybe it's a good example or bad example, but uh, I, I just want to raise a general sort of point uh, about the media coverage we get from the pilot. Because pilots so m focused on the evidence. What's your scientific finding? Does it really confirm your hypothesis or not? So we're not really getting the media coverage about the vision of UBI, um, financial security for all individuals, uh, the community impact, the stigma that uh, the you know, welfare recipients usually get, and, and so forth. So I think it's like media coverage has been pretty limited because we get coverage mostly from the pilots. So we don't really advertise and, and get covered um, for our vision. Um, and that is uh, my complaints. I think I'll just add to the complaint. I think even in India, newspapers said that Switzerland was a failure. Uh, but I think Philip did a wonderful job by saying from zero to 28, 
that was progress rather than a failure. I think um, I am. Um, I feel I, in India we go by this policy of no press is better than bad press. So um, journalists, as Guy pointed out, they can be very shallow and very uh, sensational. So we really don't um, either we write in the newspapers ourselves or with great difficulty find somebody who can write proper things. So um, the, the, the media anywhere, I think, it's, can be very, very shallow, on, particularly on a topic like UBI, uh, on, which is such a counterintuitive, and uh, journalists are no exceptions in having prejudices in the society. Uh, the Media coverage of a basic income varies widely in terms of accuracy and depth, so I don't think it's possible to make a generalized assessment. Superficial media coverage contributes little to the public understanding of a basic income, but the bigger problem is misinformation which distorts the public understanding of a basic income. As Professor Stenning mentioned, a well-known example of bad media coverage is the misreporting of the Finnish basic income experiment. And another case is the Ontario experiment in Canada. That's another bad example. The experiment was supposed to run for three years, starting in April 2017, but a change of a governor led to an abrupt end of this pilot on July 31st, 2018. And this was reported by some media outlets, like the experiment had proven to be a failure because of its costs and side effects. And another example is not an experiment, but it's an actual implementation case. And this is actually a good example of media coverage, the case of the Pandong Elementary School, the children's basic income in Chungcheongbuk-do province. So various media outlets looked at the positive effects of this children's basic income, and we saw the in-depth coverage of this case. Well, thank you so much for answering the questions. I had one final, a few more questions, but I think it's time to open um, the floor to the audience. So, okay, we have uh, Mr. Knight, oh, and then uh, first uh, Leticia, and then you. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking. So, Leticia, uh, wait for the mic. I have a question for, um, I just a uh, question for Kumningi, and in part also related with something that Sarah said at the beginning. And I was uh, wondering, uh, how are you thinking of uh, this combination of um, basic income pilots or experiments that they are meant to be temporal and unconditional? with the social and economic policies that they are basically conditional but permanent, especially in countries where there are no culture of uh, wel welfare states and there are no uh, strong culture of or, or protection, robust protection of social and economic rights. So it seems that health, for instance, that they were mentioned, it doesn't have the, um, the basis, it doesn't have the protection for everybody in order to say that basic income will be supplementary to that uh, very important social and economic claims that they need to be satisfied at a certain level. Thank you. You can reply now. 
Or should I ask? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ron. Okay. Peter Knight. Can, yes. Can you uh, introduce yourself also? Yeah, I'm Peter Knight, uh, Forward Party U.S. and BN Basic News Editor. Um, I just wanted to reflect a little bit on what seemed to be a pessimistic uh, evaluation of pilots or experiments in the United States by Sumi, and I, I don't think she really believes this, because what we have in the U.S. is an ecosystem. There are a hundred experiments or pilots, but there's research organizations involved. There are three films that are in production or about to be uh, completed. There are lobbying efforts, the Humanity Forward. There's the work of Scott Santons, which is related to that. And there is uh, the Mayors for a Guaranteed Income movement. So all of these things together build on the pilots and the income movement, which is one of this parts of the ecosystem, has a deliberate, has a clear goal, a federal basic income by 2030. And it's deliberately seeking to foment and the basic income guarantee conference, the big conference, the development of narrative and all of this aiming at the press indeed. So we really must not be so pessimistic about experiments in the US. Thanks, Peter. Philippe van Paris. Okay, Eduardo. Oh, well, was it another one? It was your friend back there, but he won't mind. Okay, uh, two quest uh, quick questions. The first one is, uh, shouldn't we pay some attention to the impact of uh, the experiments of basic income in the experiments on GDP? Now, because uh, when Guy uh, looks after his neighbor's children, providing he's paid for it, uh, his income can be taxed in order to fund a basic income. If he's looking after his own children, presumably he's not paid at all. And so if there is a shift from um, a formal labor to uh, informal activities, there is uh, an impact on the, sustain the economic sustainability on a basic income, question one. Question two, I, really, I want to, um, uh, to go back to the first intervention uh, by um, uh, Sumi Lee, uh, where she mentioned the problem of the scalability. And so I, you suggested that uh, we have to be careful. I mean, what's the point of, uh, of uh, doing experiments which uh, are intrinsically uh, unscalable? Now, we should probably distinguish between political scalability and economic scalability. So there may be things uh, that are being experimented in the US and where you say, given the positions of the two main parties in the US, forget it about uh, getting anything like that on a, a national level any time uh, this century. And uh, that's political feasibility, but you may say we can ignore that because we have to shape what is politically feasible. But what about economic scalability. Would you agree, and that's a question to the other members of the panel uh, as well, that uh, it's really not responsible to have uh, to do experiments uh, at levels uh, that are really also economically unscalable. For example, the German uh, Mein Grund Einkommen, where you have 2,000 euros individually per person. I mean, I think it's fair to say that this is not economically uh, scalable. You can do that for these 200 people, but isn't that breeding false illusions uh, to start doing experiments, look at what the people do with this uh, beautiful basic income combined with their other income? And so I thought that was partly suggested in your first intervention. Shouldn't there be a sort of deontological uh, restriction to um, experiments that may not be politically scalable within the foreseeable future, but that uh, uh, are, um, and so shouldn't we restrict them to, to experiments that are economically sustainable for all we know? 
Thank you. One last question for this first round by Eduardo Suplicy. To institute a basic income in Ukraine might be a, a very nice step towards peace, especially if Russia also agrees with the implementation of the basic income. On the day you do have a universal basic income in both countries, you will have the conditions for real peace. And Guy Stanning might have a very important role even more important than he has had in so many other experiences. I hope that he will do very well there. Thank you. Who wants to start? Gunmin? Thank you very much for the good question. The BI experiments and how we can view these experiments all over the world. It's really important to recognize what kind of views we have. For instance, there are specific variables in different places, and by adding this data to what we have previously, believing that we can get some stable, secure, predicted outcomes. Well, I believe that this is actually one of the limitations that experiments have. And when it comes to a basic income and what we can learn from this experiment is well, for instance, in some concrete contexts, what we can do is to look at how some specific results were achieved due to certain contexts and how some of the minor or major achievements came depending on the context. So I believe that we have to pay more attention to context. So for example, in this respect, regarding the effects of a basic income on health care, let's say that there is a country with a good health care system and they introduced a BI system additionally on top of the existing system, then in that case, the effect would be less powerful than we expected. And on the other hand, when there's a country with less developed healthcare system, if this introduces a BI system, then the impact would be much bigger than we can anticipate. Or in this particular place, area, well, as the healthcare system itself is not developed very well, the impact of a BI wouldn't be as big as we would have anticipated. So we believe that we have to start from that kind of perspective. Thank you. Sumi, would you like to reply? Peter, I'm not pessimistic about all these pilot programs. I love them. Uh, okay, so, you know, we need, uh, I need honest opinion to give you. And, uh, you know, I talked to, I mean, the, a lot of pilot programs in the US popped up uh, during the COVID actually. And the reason is that there is a so much federal funding available for local governments and local governments just want to burn the money. And I happened to be in a public administration department in my school, and I talked to a lot of city managers and city officials, and I live in a city of Long Beach where there's a large scale uh, experiment is currently going on and near to a uh, city of Los Angeles. And I talked to them and their funding sources are all just a one-time federal funding and otherwise, uh, all other pilot programs are usually getting funding from the private institutions. Don't get me wrong, I would rather wanna see they burn the cash through these pilot programs than anything else. So that's a good thing. But what I am trying to um, uh, convince 
is um, is uh, you know this series of uh, pilots that are, they are exciting. They're very exciting, but then. I think there should be some sort of like a, you know, you said federal 2030, there's more presence and visibility that coordinate all these, uh, you know, separate pilot programs. Because pilot programs getting so much attention. So I think, as I said, in the media question, we are really underselling the vision of a UBI. So local efforts, are very important, you know, invigorate, inspire our uh, local residents and citizens and and so on. But I think I want to see way more political commitment and visibility um, that coordinate all these uh, local efforts. That's first. And then the second is that, um, as I mentioned, these pilots are in big cities. They're pretty liberal Democrats, small cities as well, small cities as well. But then we see more in our liberal uh, areas. And uh, California has just committed a big budget, actually. Uh, Governor Newsom uh, approved a big budget for California, really a large scale um, unconditional cash transfer experiment. Uh, but I think political capacity is all different across the 50 states and at the local level. And, and as I said, the vulnerable places in the first place remain as vulnerable. That's my worry. So there, I want to say, that's why I want to see more like um, concerted effort at the, at the uh, national level. But I, I love pilots, don't get me wrong. Yeah. Uh, let, let me make one plea uh, again. What's taking place in the United States are not basic income pilots. They are experiments in moving towards basic income. They're about what the impact, they're about lessening conditionality, they're about cash rather than their individual rather than house. They have aspects of basic income. And what we're seeing is testing whether these things have the effects that we believe. So unconditionality, for example, uh, and so on, and cash. So I, th I think the language is important. So I, I, urge, I urge us to make that distinction. I would like to just well, first of all, thank uh, Eduardo for his good wishes. Uh, they've assured me of access to a bomb shelter. Uh, so I, uh, that increases my life expectancy. But I want to answer Philippe's point. I tend to agree that the, any experiment, any pilot, has to be upscalable, replicable, and feasible politically as well as well as economically and and so on institutionally and it reminded me that one of the worst features when we were doing the swiss referendum and i was involved in campaigning and speeching and so on in switzerland we were doing very well in the campaign and then one member of the group was asked on television what would be your value of a basic income that you would like. And the, I won't call him a rude name, but he said 2,500 Swiss francs a month. Immediately, we were dead in the water. We were dead in the water. And it was no use the rest of the campaign. People like myself were going around, I think Philippe also was visiting and so on, saying, no, there's no way it would be that. It would be determined by parliament, et cetera, et cetera. Feasibility would come in. We were dead in the water, okay? And I think I agree that, that doing a experiment, even with a few people, is, is unrealistic. I'm now guilty of being involved in a in a, an experiment in Wales, and I hope there's no press media here to report what I'm about to say, because I'm head of the technical advisory committee of this, uh, pi this experiment. 
And what's happening is that everybody who at age 18 who leaves a care home, an orphanage, when they come out, they're given a basic income for two years. But the basic income they're being given individually is £1,600 a month. Okay? Now, I've said that's too high because you couldn't roll it out feasibly. But the Prime Minister of Wales, he's a good man and a friend and all that, uh, he wanted to give it so that they have a dignity and a sustainable basic income. All I can say in defense of that is that it will be testing whether a substantial basic income has the negative effects that the critics claim. Okay, if it doesn't, then we can then we can say, well, look, that's even stronger evidence that actual people want to work, they want to improve their lives, they want to, etc. So I think all of those things are, are positive. So I agree that I agree that we've got to remember that it's got to be upscalable and realistic because the negative publicity can be devastating. All right, but at the same time. There are a limited number of advantages uh, uh, that are still available. Thanks to all three. Okay, second round of questions. We have three people in um, Zoom. So Jose Rocha has been raising his hand for a long time. Go ahead. Uh, hello. Uh, hello. Uh, related uh, to the demonstration objective that uh, Sarath uh, talked about in the beginning, are you uh, hearing me? Are you hearing me? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, I wonder if uh, pilots should also inquire the net contributors. Uh, so we make a pilot, we make a model, and we uh, uh, evaluate who would the net contributors be and ask them uh, if, uh, uh, if the, we had the model for the whole country, you would have to pay about this amount. How do you feel about that? And uh, what outcomes do you care about as a net contributor to a UBI in this demonstration that it uh, works and that it has positive effects? Thank you. Are you addressing your question to someone in particular, Jose? Uh, uh, in particular, no. I just brought it up because of Sarat, okay. but I would like to hear uh, the whole panel. Because mm, we don't have time for that. Um, yeah. Next question from Neil Coleman. Go ahead, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to say something about the South African situation. You know, we've had a type of a national pilot uh, since 2020. So for about four years, we've had a form of basic income, uh, although it's a very small grant, which has gone to about 11 million beneficiaries a month at its peak. And according to studies, has uh, impacted half the South African population, about 31 million South Africans. So it's a countrywide sort of pilot, if you like. Uh, it's it's uh, targeted in a, quite a narrow way, but it is countrywide and affects every uh, every community in the country uh, over four to five years. And and we are now trying to use that as a platform to introduce basic income in South Africa. And uh, the panel's uh, uh, um, insights have been extremely useful because a lot of the impacts that they talk about in relation to the experiments have been um, observed in South Africa. And in the chat, I've uh, included a letter from the South African president in which he talks about the outcome of uh, studies that have been done in South Africa on the impact of this very small basic income on um, uh, independence of women on economic activity, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, I think what's important here is that it is, it is incorporated and paid for by the national budget. The evidence of the impact is, is, is widespread. Um, and it's uh, difficult to reverse. We're going into an election year. So the issue now is that, uh, is to use this, as I say, as a springboard for permanent basic income. And I think the con the context in South Africa is very relevant because the extent of distress, poverty and hunger uh, uh, creates an imperative for some form of income support, which is underpinned by our constitution. But 
It's a subject of sharp contestation, uh, particularly from our our treasury. Um, and uh, so there's a big, big campaign, including court action, which we've undertaken uh, to uh, extend the uh, the this grant to remove some of the very narrow uh, uh, forms of targeting and so on. So in that context, some sort of local pilot or experiment in South Africa, localized, would actually be a backward step. You know, it would take pressure off the government. Uh, it would we would lose our initiative to move to towards permanent basic income. So it's very important that South Africa could become one of the global leaders in introducing a national form of basic income. And I think one of the questions in one of the sessions that I was involved in was, what is the relative um, leverage, I suppose, uh, of the global South in terms of um, introducing basic income, as opposed to you know a lot of the experiments which have been in the global North. I do understand that there've been experiments in Kenya and Namibia and, and other places, but the larger uh, national e experience. Um, so it'd be good to hear your uh, panelists uh, comments, comments on this um, and whether we should not be now moving into a new period of pushing, of moving away from pilots to pushing for the introduction of national policies, you know, perhaps particularly, as I say, in the global south where the, where the need is so massive. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Really important question. And also now Klaus Samber has been waiting. Go ahead, please. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I want to uh, mention that uh, unconditional basic income petition in the Austrian parliament was took place. And we are not asking for a trial or an experiment. We are asking for implement an unconditional basic income. And uh, with exactly what we uh, discuss in all our uh, discussions about UBI, uh, so that this uh, should enable every person with the main uh, with to have a dignified existence and the real participation in society and so on. And the most important point is the last sentence of this uh, uh, petition. The amount financing and implementation are to be enshrined uh, in a law in a process in which civil society is significant involved. So that means we are not asking for experiment, we are asking for implementation, and we want to prepare together with the politicians in this process. The uh, petition was given uh, to uh, the Committee for Social Affairs in Austria, and uh, there was different uh, meetings and so on, but at the end, it was not uh, accepted. But now we have a new chair of the Social Party, and we have the next discussion in October this year, and he is in favor of that. And uh, this party is growing now much uh, more than before, and perhaps uh, we make a second attempt a little later, not for a trial, for the implementation immediately. Thank you. Interesting debate. Implementation of trials. Thanks. One last question from Reinhard Haas. A quick, quick question, please. Uh, yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, I just wanted to raise a question about negative press and uh, reporting. I, I would think this is part of the game. And uh, I mean, uh, you can't avoid it because it's part of the ideological fight against basic income. So if, uh, I mean, any experiment and any test can be distorted and will be distorted in order to undermine their reputation. I think it's better to focus on re uh, getting sort of journalists and media in support of basic income than trying to avoid negative press, in my opinion. I compare it with Palestine-Israel conflict. It depends whom you watch. Whether you watch Al Jazeera or the German news, you get very different reporting about the same event. Thank you. Thank you so much. So this is a very unusual end of a roundtable because we don't have time to listen to the replies of uh, the
the speakers, but uh, we have time to think about uh, possible replies. So thanks so much. A big applause for you, all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.